Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. My favorite thing about my dad is how adventurous he is. <laughs> Any rare animal is difficult to study, especially species that are nocturnal and not easy to find. Down. He's back up. You have to keep moving, and it's a really intense thing being out there. It's exciting. It's, it's sort of an adrenaline rush. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. I have Sophia, another wrestler on the movie. Who's that guy? He's a, he's a character. <laughs> Is that all I am to you? Yeah. Just a character? He does my dad. Me and my dad are about to go on a three-day trip canoeing down a beautiful river, the Devil's River. The water there is so beautiful. It's really clear, and you can see all the animals and fish below. Uh, right now, we're trying to find this spring. We can't find it, but we heard it, so we're coming over here. <laughs> is like spring water good to drink, or you shouldn't drink it? Yeah. You can just drink it's it? Pure. it? It tastes a little funny, though. It tastes funny? Yeah? Like a salamander? No. Uh, blind catfish? I don't know what they taste like, so... <laughs> Good point. <sighs> Will it ever stop flowing at any time? If you're taking water out at a higher rate that it, then it can recharge, then, yeah, there are times where it, it could stop flowing. All the springs combined together form the river. Each rapid is different from the rest. Some are hard and some are easy. Me and my dad are about to go down this very, very hard rapid. Ready? Three, two, one! Out, it was still exciting and fun. <laughs> Did you intentionally yeah. jump out? Or no, it was, it was like right, it was right there, and uh -huh. it hit it, and it started falling over. Yeah. And I, I it, it was gonna tip over, so I had to kind of get out. Yeah. Well, I didn't try to jump you out. You did it for the team. Let's go swimming now. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, right out there. One, two, right out there. Yeah, two, three, go. Each time we went swimming, you wouldn't be able to not see any fish. There were fish everywhere. Is it a special river? It's pretty special because there aren't there aren't many rivers like this left in not just in Texas but in the country. Will this river be here when I'm growing up? I mean I think the concern is will will we be able to like prevent people from pulling too much water out of the aquifer that feeds this this river? And then will it look the same? You know, will will you have more homes? Are you going to have 
wind turbines and blinking lights up on the top of the canyons. So why do you like to fish? Why do I like to fish? Yeah. Um, it's one of the few things that I've done that requires so much focus and allows you to disconnect. My favorite thing about my dad is how adventurous he is. Easy, easy, easy. Let him run, let him run. You get that motion, like whenever he stops, you reel it in, and then he's probably gonna take another run here. Yeah, don't, try not to pull him out of the water, because that, that hook may come out. Okay, you think he's ready to come in? No. You want to hold him? Does he do not bite? You take it out. Okay, you're gonna hold it. Okay. Kiss him in the mouth. Give him. No, like a, nothing. Yeah. No, no, no. You don't. You don't want to kiss him on the cheek. It's rude. Ready? I'm gonna just push him off. Okay. That was a big fish. Can I catch one again? Yeah. Oh! <laughs> she is loving this trip and she can't stop fishing. She hasn't complained once and she's like totally into it. I asked her like, do you feel lonely out here? And she said, no, there's like all these birds and wildlife and sounds and the water. And I don't feel lonely at all. Like I feel it's peaceful. Why do you think it's important to conserve places like this? Um, because there's a lot of wildlife here and animals and fish. I mean, there might be a lot of other rivers you can go on, but they're not all the same. So you're 10. What's your favorite memory? so far in your life? Probably this. This is? Yeah. Really? I'm really excited to go back on the Devils and have a new adventure with my dad. Get out of its way and get to the other side of the This is a story about some special people. Meet Kevin Ferguson and Robin Dabney. Kevin runs both Kickapoo Cavern State Park and Devil's Sinkhole. And Robin, well, she's doing the dirty work at Dinosaur Valley State Park. Besides working in our state parks, they are also firefighters volunteer firefighters, and this is a look into what it takes to be on the fire line with the State Park's Wildland Fire Team. Here at Cedar Hill State Park, south of Dallas, a prescribed burn is underway to help restore the park's native Blackland Prairie. It's an extremely rare habitat that we are trying to manage. Uh, Cedar Hill has, in our state park system, probably the best representation of Blackland Prairie, and we're managing it to kind of restore it back to its natural diversity. Uh, the way this stuff is brushy here, we want to get down and around the end. For Kevin, he is in training. You want to split them into two? Yeah. Okay. 
a test to see if he has what it takes to be a future firing boss. The fire behavior is, is very good. We're, we're getting what we want. This woody debris is moving out into the prairies. We're getting good behavior in there, taking a lot of that stuff with it. We're happy with what we're getting. For Robin, this is just her third prescribed burn. Don't worry about it on the road. We're burning, burning both you have to keep moving, and it's a really intense thing being out there. It's exciting. It's, it's sort of an adrenaline rush. Um, you're walking. You can see the fire dripping. You can hear the trees, the grasses igniting, uh, and you can feel the heat for sure. All right, let's move. It's about to get hot. The team's goal is to burn and help restore five to 10,000 acres of parkland every year, all as volunteers as their daily duties continue back at the office. I love my day-to-day -day job that I do at the park, but um, being brought into something that, that you feel is, is not only this important, but is this exciting as well. It's just a passion when you really believe in something like that, it's, you know, you make it happen. It's neat to come out and be able to work on a project that from start to finish you can accomplish in one day. See all the grass, see the trees beforehand, drag the fire, everything lights up, and then it's black. So you can really see it through all the stages from beginning to end. And it's neat, it feels good, like you accomplished something. We're gonna run two heats today. 45 pounds. To be part of the fire team, every year the firefighters have to pass a fitness run of sorts. Always a little nervous, but excited as well. Uh, this will be the fifth year running, so uh, it's fun. <laughs> I've gotten out and walked some. I've carried a little bit of weight, but I haven't actually gotten to carry the 45 pounds yet. Um, so I've kind of been nervous waking up with nightmares leading, <laughs> leading up to this. Heavy. <laughs> Ready, set, go. I have to walk 45 minutes with a 45 pound pack, um, three miles. So it's, it's a big ordeal. <laughs> Somebody's chasing me! <laughs> the point of it is to walk. You're not allowed to run. So one foot on the ground at all times. <laughs> what, what lap is this? Going strong. Over halfway. This is, this is five. So we'll get called out on wildfires, prescribed burns, and some of these last for a week, two weeks at a time, and you're hiking up in Fort Davis area or Cap Rock where there's hills. 30 seconds ahead. And so this is just kind of a test to make sure that you're in shape and capable to do all of that year round. My feet are starting to hurt, <laughs> and I'm feeling the 45 pounds. <laughs> you can be going for uh, you know longer than 12 hours. You could really be tested on your physical ability, and this is one way to get a snapshot of what you can handle. Man. <laughs> Good run. I talk to myself the whole way, and I listen to music, and I close my eyes, whatever I have to do, and I get through it. I need help. <laughs> I feel relieved, for sure, now that it's over. See you next year. Hundreds of homes destroyed in one of the worst wildfire outbreaks in Central Texas history. The biggest burning in and around Bastrop State Park right now. More than 25,000 acres. Again, 476 homes destroyed. 2011 proved to be the most devastating wildfire season in Texas history. At Bastrop, Kevin was one of the first on the scene. At Bastrop, you were looking at a historic buildup of fuels which provided for conditions that were extremely volatile. It was primed to go and it, it, and it took off like a shot. If I get around them, I'll come back there and look at it with you. 
we went straight for over 48 hours before getting any sleep, and then it was an hour here and an hour there, and we never knew it was going to be like that, and you had to be prepared to be able to endure whatever's thrown at you, especially in an emergency situation like that. Earlier in April, fires hit Possum Kingdom State Park, and it was Robin's first wildfire. When the fire came over at Possum Kingdom, we knew it would take out the vegetation. We knew it would take out everything that was in its path that we weren't able to protect. But we went in and we dug around some of the structures, tried to protect the houses. We tried to protect the cabins as well, and, and everything there survived. Both fires burned thousands of acres of parkland. But the team was able to save all the park's historic structures and cabins. An ember fell in the crotch of that juniper tree. The training and qualifications of our state park firefighters allowed our firefighters to quickly flip a switch from a prescribed fire mode to a wildland firefighting mode. We were able to protect our park infrastructure, protect our park natural resources and cultural resources, and save these state legacies, our state parks. The fire team here has, has proved through multiple wildfires that all of their firefighters are well trained and can work together um, to accomplish something. And, and in this case, it was protecting buildings and saving parks. As a team, training together, uh, working together, we're ready and we've learned what it takes to be effective and to be safe, and whatever happens, we're ready to go. We're about uh, three or four miles from Oklahoma in Wichita County, Texas. Look at this one over here, Silas. Well, it doesn't come out vertically. You want to set a trap? Yeah. A trap and a camera. I'm a graduate student at Texas State University in the Wildlife Ecology Program. And we are surveying for Texas kangaroo rats. They hop on their back legs like a kangaroo, hence the name. It looks a lot like your pet store gerbil, about again and a half as big, with a white tail tip. It is a state-threatened species. So it does seem to be pretty rare geographically. It's only been found in 11 counties in Texas, and within the past 20 years, only found in five of those 11 counties. They're about the handsomest rodent that you can find. If we lose it here, it is done as a species. It would be an easy species to pay a little bit of attention to and keep on the map. Got anything over there? There's two or three. Today we're surveying to see if kangaroo rats are using the same burrows and areas as they were this summer. There's quite a bit of burrows over here. Fresh kick out. Let's us know that it's active and not abandoned. We're setting motion sensitive cameras that will record video um, in infrared. And we're also setting spring loaded box traps. I'm going to bait the area. Are we seeing just the last vestiges of populations that are hanging on? We don't know. Uh, I think. That's the reason uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service want to find that out. Right at the next intersection, there should be a burrow. Well, we are assisting Texas State University on Texas kangaroo rat research. And uh, in addition, we're actually funding them through our state wildlife grant program. It's a species that's not federally endangered yet, but it's a species of concern for us. It's, it's obviously declining. We don't have a lot of great information on this species, so we're trying to learn as much as we can. But it's a species that we're concerned about, and it's been a concern for a while. I haven't seen one yet. I've seen some other species of kangaroo rat, but not the Texas kangaroo rat, so rocky form. 
I'm hoping to. More times than not, we'll get them on the camera and not in the traps. They're rather trap shy. All right, we're giving up. Fingers crossed for some rat activity. Any rare animal is difficult to study, especially species like this that are they're nocturnal and they're elusive. They're not easy to find. Roadside surveys have been kind of a survey method of choice. 1,500 survey miles total, so that's driving around at night uh, between 10 p.m. and about 5 a.m. The success is always low. You've got to cover a lot of miles to find a very few individuals. It gets a little bit tedious, and some nights we went without seeing a single one. Went home a little upset. He's back out. He's like groundhogging us. Up, up, down. Been dark about an uh, hour and a half, two hours, and I already got some activity. Cotton rat. Well, we only saw one. Uh, two kangaroo rats. <laughs> Pretty quick. <laughs> Weighs a few hairs off to get a DNA sample. Sorry, buddy. Then we're gonna weigh him at 93 grams. And then we're going to get some standard length measurements on them. 42 millimeters for hind foot, ears, eight, and a tail. Right at 210. I love a tail. All right. We would like to find enough of these animals to say that, OK, here's a species that may have been in decline. If we learn enough about it, we can, instead of putting it on the endangered species list, implement some management strategies. It's one of our prime objectives at Texas Parks Life. Hey, hey, hey. Keep things off the endangered species list. 80 grams, the bag's 10 grams. Oh, yeah. oh another uh, Texas kangaroo rat. Nice. If they exist in these roadside habitats, they may be evolutionarily adapted to fire and bison herds, those disturbed environments that would occur after those events. They hop, adapted to wide open spaces, bare ground created by some agricultural practices, by grazing, may be very suitable for these animals. Short grass, well grazed, lots of areas between grass so they can move around freely edges of farm fields where you have the little bit of bare ground next to the fence, and that seems to be their ticket. They are unique. It's part of this ecosystem that's been here for a long, long time. Why not care for it? They don't have any detrimental effect to the landowners. They don't invade houses, don't dig large holes, they don't disrupt farming practices, so they can exist here very easily. There's more interest in non-game species than there has been in the past. We really need to have more natural history information on the whole gamut of wildlife. We know really very little. This is great information. 181. We're learning more about the habitat needs of the species, its biology, its life history. And it's very valuable as we try to develop recommendations for private landowners. So this guy is ready for release. Any key to the future of this species is going to be through private lands. <laughs>